Hello and welcome to episode 45, Christianity, Gender and Society Part 1, where we'll be discussing Christian teachings on sex and gender. We've been working tirelessly on our upcoming audiobook, Developments in Christian Thought, which is due to be released free of charge on August 28, 2018. If you're listening to this past August 28th, you can find a link to the audiobook in the iTunes description of this episode. We can't wait to share it with you, so we decided to release one of our favourite chapters early. What you're about to hear is part one of chapter eight, Gender and Society. In this instalment, we look at the history of the church relating to issues surrounding sex and gender. Next week, we'll be releasing the second instalment of this chapter, where we'll be looking at secular challenges to the church through the work of thinkers such as Simone de Beauvoir and Harriet Taylor. The audiobook is 24 chapters long, as well as 12 discussions between myself, Ollie, and Andrew. You can expect interviews with Eugene Nagasawa, Daniel Hill, Tom Atkinson, Peter Adamson, Joseph Shaw, Eric Metexas, Christopher Rowland, Alison Stone, Michael Wilcoxon, David Ford, Peter Oakes, and Tim Mawson, to name but a few. As I mentioned, it's free, so hit the link in the iTunes description if you're listening past August 28th. If it's not August 28th yet, then kick back, relax, and enjoy Chapter 8, Gender and Society, Part 1. Chapter 8. Gender and Society The role of men and women in society has changed dramatically in the last century. The rise of feminism has challenged traditional Christian family values of gender roles, parenthood and the family dynamic. The increase of divorce, access to contraception, the education of women, blended families and civil partnerships shows that the landscape of family life is changing faster than any other period of history. Issues over gender and society are at the forefront of contemporary public debate. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a family? In this chapter, we'll be asking questions like, should Christian teachings resist current secular views of gender? Have secular views of gender equality successfully undermined Christian gender roles? Is motherhood liberating or restricting? And is the idea of family culturally determined? And if so, to what extent? In part one, we'll be looking at Christian teachings. And in part two, we'll be looking at secular challenges and Christian responses. So we joined this chapter by Miss Annabel Borthwick. Annabel, why are you interested in gender and society? Um, I just found it interesting. I find it interesting because it's such a contested topic in contemporary society. There's a lot of like media attention surrounding it, especially mm. at the moment. And I just like the way it directly relates to the expectations of me as a woman, mm. so how I should behave, what I should do, um, and my purpose, and therefore the purpose of all women, really. So before we jump into some introductory questions, can we give a nice sexy overview about what's going to happen in this chapter? What are we going to be talking about? So we're going to be talking about the role of men and women in society. This is something just like we said in the introduction, which is hotly contested and debated uh, in the current kind of climate. Um, and it's something that is very, very interesting because it affects everybody. It affects men. It affects women. It's connected to rights, connected to uh, family values. It's it's something that can kind of be applied to any kind of school of thought, really. Mm. It's going to be a really, really exciting chapter. And there's going to be loads of stuff to learn about, which is going to be great. So we start off with some uh, basic terminology then. What do we mean by the word sex? Sex is categorizing someone based on biology so looking at reproductive functions and reproductive organs and putting people into essentially binaries of male and female okay so if i have a penis i'm a male if i don't have a penis if i have a vagina then i'm a female pretty much unless you kind of go into the intersex debate where you've got ambiguous genitalia but potentially a discussion for another day <laughs> so what's sexism so sexism is discriminating against somebody because of their sex. So it's very straightforward. So, you know, Annabelle's saying that we have different uh, sex organs and these are kind of the people we are. Sexism is if you treat somebody differently depending on 
what you would perceive as their their sex. So it may be, for example, uh, that individual is a woman. Therefore, I don't think they may be as intelligent as a man. That would be a really good example of just mm. uh, a sexist statement um, that has kind of no scientific kind of backing behind it. It's just a discriminatory prejudice. Could you give some more examples of sexist sentences that might be slurred by sexist people? <laughs> so you want examples of sexism? Yeah. So I guess if like it could come down to parenting, so the mm. expectation of a woman might be to stay at home, cook and clean and all of that stuff. Uh, I think men like to joke about having their wife or partner make them a sandwich. That's a classic one that seems to come up quite a lot on the internet. Mm. Um, but it can, it can work both ways as well. Um, so men, men could be judged to, to say like, you have to do this particular type of work. You're like, you're around the house. They do the DIY stuff uh. and, uh, and all of those things. And it, it's kind of built into the expectation that like men have a role in society. Women have a role in society. And that if you don't fit into that category of expectation, mm then you are kind of seen as an outcast or you're seen as alien or like or you need to fix your behavior to fit the expectations of others. Okay, so how's this different to gender then? Yeah, so gender is the the more complex one really because there are lots of different elements that we need to explore. Um so you can have the term gender biology which is kind of linked directly to sex in which uh, you you kind of uh you could tell someone's gender purely because of the physical attributes that they have. Now the problem the reason why that can be problematic is that uh, not everybody necessarily expresses or identifies with the gender that they would have uh physically or biologically. Um mm. so your gender identity will be the gender that you feel most comfortable in depending on the like it doesn't matter which sex you have so let's say if you took somebody who was male but they identified with the more feminine gender qualities that society is presumably dictated are the feminine qualities so in being like really stereotypical right now it would be kind of you know your things like women wear pink uh, like mm. and, and they, like if you and girl, young girls get brought up to play with dolls and and play with makeup and uh like have tea sets and stuff that they have whereas boys grow up with action man and and sports equipment and all of that stuff and growing up if if a girl gr says actually i i more identify with all of these male things then that's that would be them identifying with the male gender and then you have gender expression which is actually the like the living out out of that identity so somebody could technically like identify with the female gender as as a man but not actually feel free to express it and then that could cause a whole bunch of issues um if they do express that then they then that's what we call gender expression so we have gender biology gender identification and gender expression there is all three interlinked ideas and this can lead to lots of problems so for example people often confuse sex and gender together so they think that if they see someone that looks a certain way that they are a certain way and that may not necessarily be the case and that can lead to you know uh, misunderstanding prejudice discrimination etc yeah, I also wanted to add as well that I didn't make it particularly clear, but it, this isn't always a binary thing. Um, so I said that a male might identify as like a female or a female might identify mm. as a male, but it's not always that clear cut. Uh, you might have somebody who very much identifies with lots of different parts of gender identity that, are, that come across the spectrum and that to kind of label them as such as like that you're being more male right now is perhaps not the most uh, discreet or proper way that you should be dealing with that type of language in the first place. And this language is completely embedded in our culture. You know, even phrases like man up. Like if I tell Andy to man up, Annabelle, what am I kind of implying you should do? Well, pretty much so you should conform with this idea that a man is supposed to be this macho, non-crying being which is supposed to resist any, well, feminine, feminine in inverted commas, feminine mm. aspects. And it has that other aspect to it as well. On the flip side, I say, Andrew, stop being such a girl. And now I mean that being a girl is seen as a sign of weakness or something like this. And it carries those sexist connotations with it. Yeah, and things like, you know, don't throw like a girl and things like that, which are implied to be negative. Mm. Um, so like man up is more to be like, you know, you're responsible. You need to be kind of more in control or more powerful. To woman up isn't a thing. It's almost kind of implying that women aren't responsible, not powerful, not in control. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I think it perhaps might be more anecdotally, but it would be it would be good to see the studies on this. But it appears that when when children are growing up, that it seems more reasonable to allow your daughter to adopt kind of male 
identity in certain ways and that uh, i guess there's quite a big movement of women being labeled as like brave and encourage them to be like the heroes and stuff like that because that Mm. hasn't always been present in a lot of the kind of childhood stories or like media that has been kind of perpetuated in the last couple of decades um but if you had a young boy who wanted to start identifying with certain like traditional female roles, mm. that isn't kind of embraced in the same way yet. Which means that uh, the one way of looking at that is that there is still that issue of that the male is seen as the better identity, and that when a when a man wants to pursue that uh, sort of female identity, that's almost like shunned and said like, no, you can't do that. But it's okay for women to adopt the kind of male role. There's some quite serious implications for this, though, because you've got this idea of being able to express emotion being quite a feminine trait. So therefore, young boys and men shouldn't express their emotions. And it's mm. like quite topical at the moment because of uh, like looking at areas of male suicide. So this idea that men can't or should not be allowed to express how they're feeling, arguably the studies at the moment consider like suggesting that this is having a very negative impact upon male mental health. And therefore, the way we look at gender in the whole of society needs a complete reshuffle. Good. So I think that's a good working definition of gender for now and some of the issues that are going to arise with sexism, gender and the difference between sex and gender. But this whole chapter is called Gender and Society. And it might seem a little bit patronising because you're obviously living in a society now unless you've got hold of this in the middle of nowhere. And you, so you kind of can look around you and see what society is. Kind of dictionary definition might be the aggregate of people living together you know the coming together of people living together of lots of different people and the kind of things that arise from that so you might have different social interactions different social norms different ways of bringing up a child what's socially okay in that society this could be given by laws that are dictated in a democracy by the people and created by the people so you've got that layer of politics as well so society kind of is a big melting pot of all the things that come to be when people come together. In our last chapter on Marxism and liberation theology, we talked about the idea of uh, how culture kind of creates an environment in which certain things kind of become the norm. Um, and while it wasn't emphasized directly, um, I did mention a term called the uh, the superstructure, um, which goes hand in hand with what Marx would call it, the base, which is where all of the production and stuff happens, like the kind of material thing. Um, whereas the superstructure is the ideas of a particular society, which which uh, are usually, from the Marxist perspective, dictated from the people who are in power, uh, whether or not that's from universities, but also through the uh, through the media and how the state might use that media to kind of uh, teach or to at least maybe use as propaganda to influence the way in which people think. And I think that is a big part of what we might call a society. It's the, the general ideas that become the popular ones, which mm. either a lot of people identify with or a lot of people are at least aware of. And the, when, when you have people come onto the news, like, it's not a surprise that a lot of people use the same types of terminology. And this impacts gender on a, a very significant way, because if it is, if the most popular ideas from academics and from people on the news, or particularly when it gets into popular culture, if the language is being used daily and it's all you hear, then it's no surprise that we start using particular pronouns and, and, and identify people into particular genders and grow those expectations where like if every movie you've ever watched uh, it's a male lead and the male takes a particular role and that the female is always like the prize to be caught then um, that will drip feed into mm. the wider consciousness now it's more complicated than that because it doesn't mean that like we are all sort of robots that like just take the information download it into our brains and then say like that's the way it is but it can have an influence. It would be naive of us to say that we we are impenetrable to mm. media and the way it wants to get a message across because advertising clearly works and uh, we're all susceptible to that. It's, it works the same way. Does this tie into the idea of the patriarchy? What What is the patriarchy? We're going to be using this word quite a lot. So quite simply, patriarchy is this idea of, of the rule of the father. So a patriarchal society is one that is dominated essentially by men. Um, so relationships domestic relationships, power relationships, um, social structures, the government are dominated and ruled by the man. This is similar, but not 
completely the same as um, an androcentric society, which I would argue, well, personally, that we are more of than a patriarchal society, um, where male masculine interests are placed at the centre of one's worldview and society's worldview. And and whether intentionally or not, we privilege men and the and male interests and everything is focused around male desire and what what works best for a man it's is feminism another key term we need to find before we jump into part one what is feminism and is it trying to tackle this idea of the patriarchy as you've just defined annabelle um so feminism is the belief that men and women should be treated equally in society uh, and there have been a large amount of uh, different movements and different emphasis on exactly what the role of feminism should play uh, in making this belief a reality. The stages are, are broken down, at least commonly in uh, intellectual circles, broken down into three different waves of feminism. Um, first wave, second wave, and third wave. Whoa, let's ride that wave. What is the first, second, and third wave of feminism? So the, the first wave of feminism uh, is mostly to do with the suffragette movement which is uh so suffrage talking about the idea of voting so uh, being able to get women the vote now uh it's interesting because women were originally first given the vote in 1918 but that was for a sort of minority group of women in that you had to be over 30 and uh, i believe you also had to have certain property rights as well mm. uh so that meant that it, while it appeared that the movement was getting or making progress, which it certainly was. It wasn't actually until 1928 where women, all women, were actually given the vote. Right, second wave. The second wave of feminism kind of started in the 1960s, um, kind of headed by people like Simone de Beauvoir, uh, which we'll be talking about later. Uh, the main kind of kind of thrust of the arguments of the second wave of feminism are more to do with mindsets. So just like Andrew said, in the first wave of feminism, women achieve the vote. So in 1918 in the UK, women achieve uh, the vote. But there was kind of a, a thought that this didn't really change too much. As much as women now had the right to vote, the majority of institutions, whether that's government or business, were still male-dominated. Consensus of thought in the second wave of feminism that you needed to change the mindset of men and women mm. to try and make both sexes more open to the idea of there needed to be a more kind of change of the institutions and the, the general kind of cultural landscape. So as much as the first wave was more about rights, the second wave was more about a changing mindset. What about the third wave then? So the third wave kind of brought in wider experiences. So in terms of the experiences of uh, women of different classes, different um, ethnicities, um, and the idea of gender in, in general, kind of what we covered earlier with all those issues. Um, this kind of ties in quite nicely to also what's referred to as post-feminism, mm. um, which, whereas, well, it resisted se the second wave in the sense that the second wave emphasised the need to resist female roles and female expectations, expectations of women in society. So beauty expectations and women should like stay in the home and things like that. The, the post-feminist movement allowed women to reclaim like the beauty expectations. So you can wear lipstick and be liberating and, mm. and it kind of, it resisted and reclaimed and it's still continuing to do so the second wave. Um, arguably some feminists are like say today that post-feminists, are missing the legal emphasis so they have like less legal and rights move rights driven politics it's more about beauty but it's contested so let me pose you two extra questions is feminism just for women and are there any different strands within feminism that we should be aware of before moving on so feminism is not just for women like we said the definition of feminism is it wants equality for both men and women um, and i think this is something that's kind of been mistranslated a bit or kind of lost throughout the different waves and the discussions um there are lots of different types of feminism um, and i think a lot of the more extreme examples of feminism are the ones that normally get into the news uh, the ones that are kind of often shared and maybe not fully understood as being the whole kind of consensus um a feminist is going to say that the patriarchy affects men and women, that mm. gender norms and expectations affect men as well as women. So, you know, for example, a feminist may say that, you know, there's more men in executive positions in business than uh, women. This is something that needs to be corrected. Likewise, fem a male feminists may say as well that, you know, I feel like as a man, I can't fully express my emotions in male environments or even in society in general. You know, if a, if a man cries in public, for example, they may feel demasculated, they may be ridiculed for it. And just like Annabelle said earlier, 
you know, the rate of male suicide is very, very high. And a lot of feminists think that the correlation there is between being unable to express how you feel and be fully human. Um, and, you know, feeling very, uh, like there's no way out and that the only way out is to take your own life. Um, so I wouldn't say that feminism is just for women. Some feminists would disagree with that. Some radical feminists would definitely say feminism is something that women need to own, but that is not every kind of feminism. Mm, worth mentioning. And, uh, the age of 45 being the biggest killer of males in the UK. And it's one of the leading causes of death in males under the age of 45 worldwide as well. Um, Andrew, could you give us a little bit of, can you branch out this tree of feminism and blossom some leaves on some definitions, which are different parts of the tree of feminism? <laughs> I sure can. Uh, yeah, so we've already talked, to, uh, or at least name dropped radical feminism there Bef quickly before we get onto that. Um, perhaps the most common or the one that gets talked about the most, in, at least I hear in UK media discussion is what's called liberal feminism, in which the aim is to essentially try and reform society through pushing, uh, through any sort of legislation which mm. will give more rights to women um but it's not just legislation it can be the wider discussion on uh like female expectations and, and gender roles and stuff like that i guess one of the major things that is still currently in in discussion today is what's called the second shift where uh, while women are now beginning to gain more rights on the front of actually being able to get into the workplace when it comes to when both partners uh, get home if you if you were in a, a male and female partnership, that the woman is still picking up more of the housework, even though they are working equivalent jobs, earning the same amount of money, working the same amount uh, time wise uh, out in the workplace. Women are still kind of there's this general expectation that they still do more. Uh, that's that's an important discussion that needs to be addressed, because if we want equality, it can't just come through legislation. It has to be a wider cultural uh, understanding that you can't, as a man, uh, just allow that to happen and women mm. have to play their part as well in making sure that the discussion is being had. Radical feminism, that's the idea that essentially a, a patriarchal society can't really be reformed, um, particularly now with the amount of uh, patriarchal institutions that have taken hold and perhaps the understanding that power doesn't like to give up power and that if men are primarily taking positions in politics and in big business, why would they give up uh, what they have? Uh, in which sense then uh, you should move to a, a model in which women should seek to kind of move or away from this or that society needs to radically reform or, or completely just kind of start from scratch and have uh, a much better sense of of equality some radical feminists would say though that you can't reach equality if there are both men and women in society in the first place and that you can actually live in sort of separatist movements as it were so before you go on to part one of this chapter you need to know all of those things we've just said in a little bit of depth what sex is what sexism is what gender is how it's different from sex have a good idea of what society is the patriarchy and feminism itself as well as the three waves and perhaps you should know liberal and radical feminism as articulated by andrew there Part 1. Christian Teachings So, fundamentally, what does the Bible say about gender? So, like we've mentioned in previous chapters, the Bible is split into two main sections, the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, and the New Testament. Uh, we're going to start off by looking, I think, in the Old Testament, but we're going to be looking at some New Testament teachings as well, especially the teachings of Paul. So, I think we're going to start, Jack, in the beginning. In the beginning. Okay, Genesis by chance? Yes, the first book of the Bible. Uh, what a classic. Let's jump into it. So let's start with Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. So in Genesis, God creates man and woman, the first man and the first woman, who are Adam and Eve. Now, there's actually different accounts of their creation in Genesis, but we can definitely pick apart some of the key kind of uh, relationship between the two genders and their relationship with God from this from this chapter. So let's start with Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, God creates man and woman at the same time, and he creates them in his image now it's quite up for debate what this actually means um not many christians believe they literally look like god but maybe that they inhabit kind of certain qualities that god has for example beneficence love uh knowledge things like this from genesis 1 man and woman being created at the same time in god's image what what kind of teachings do you think christians get from 
from from Genesis 1. I mean, I guess a a generous reading of this is that uh, both men and women are equal in that they were both created at the same time, they're both human, and that because, as you've said, the the certain qualities that are God- godly or godlike uh, that might incline us to, towards our creator both men and women presumably share because it doesn't make it clear that you know there was a different role or anything like that but of course uh, genesis 2 might have something to say about that so jack why are you reading from is that the is that the king james version of the bible it is it's it's my favorite copy of the of the bible the king james version do you know who else whose favorite it is dan dennett Okay, it's his favourite as well. So hence why I'm reading from it. it. It's just written in a in a wonderful way. I just I, I'm just mad for it. Let me give a quotation from verse 21, Genesis 2. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Beautifully read there, Jack. Thank you, Andrew. That's very kind of you. Um, Annabel, um, what's, what's the, what's the impact here on gender and society? What message can a Christian take from this? So arguably you could take a quite negative, um, perception towards women and gender from, from this passage. Um, looking at the idea of women being inferior and their role in society, therefore inferior as they were, um, created from Adam, as Adam's helper, um, God, breathe the breath of life into Adam specifically mm. and, and not Eve. However, this is where you can kind of evaluate it a little bit. And uh, there are scholars such as um, Phyllis Tribble who have looked at this idea of a helper and said, okay, these, the word used in Hebrew for helper in, in this passage is also used in relation to God throughout uh, the Hebrew Bible. So for example, in Psalms and Deuteronomy. So Eve being Adam's helper is not a negative thing and therefore should not have a negative implication upon gender roles and women's position in society also interestingly trouble looks at this idea of order so in she said it's kind of silly how in genesis 1 early church fathers have looked at it and gone oh amazing humans made last pinnacle creation we are the most important however they then flip to genesis 2 and eve being created second is suddenly a bad thing. It's suddenly mm. a negative thing to be, to be made after something else. So she argues that the problem with Genesis and the Eve story is not the text itself, but it's the sexist readings that have been placed upon the text. Is there anything else important in Genesis worth mentioning here? So we've looked at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Now we're going to look at Genesis 3. Now this is famous for having the fall of mankind in it. Um, so let's kind of unpack what happens in the chapter and then we're going to talk about the implications of this for gender and society. So in Genesis 3, we have the now very well known story and famous story of um, the temptation of the serpent. So the serpent is kind of the devil um, in the third chapter of Genesis um, and it tempts Eve, the first woman, to eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil and this tree is in the middle of the garden of eden and if you eat from it um, god has said that you will die mm. um, which is how adam and eve have free will in the garden because they're allowed to do anything they want apart from eat from this tree eve succumbs to the temptation of the serpent and eats from the fruit and then encourages adam to do so as well and therefore this is called the fall of mankind where adam and eve are eventually uh, kicked out of the garden of eden or paradise and that relationship between god and human that was divine and sacred is broken now this is very important for lots of different reasons and we'll get into the gender in a sec but god gives very very specific uh kind of instructions and kind of tells adam and eve what's going to happen to them he says that the man adam is now going to work the earth it's his now his kind of duty to work and toil away 
He's going to tell women that women will have pain in childbirth. So it's kind of implied that women wouldn't have had pain in childbirth mm -hmm. before then. Remember that the reason why God created Adam and Eve in the first place was to have this divine relationship. And the idea was that Adam and Eve were going to create an, a, a fantastic utopian civilization that was going to be full of loads of music and art and, and culture. Um, this isn't going to happen now. Um, man and women are going to work and women are going to have pain during childbirth and their lives are going to be full of death and misery. Um, and this is called original sin. This is the idea that Adam and Eve commit the first sin against God, going against God commandment to not eat from the tree and they do those who have listened to chapter four already on augustine's view on human nature will be far more familiar and um, we go in a lot more depth there so if you haven't listened to that chapter please go back and listen to chapter four where we talk about it in a lot more depth andrew do you have a quotation from your favorite version of the bible at hand i uh, i'm not gonna there's not too much i want to say but just on the bit that uh ollie has mentioned right at the end there it's always nice to get a, a little bit more of the king james in there why uh, because I believe it's Sam Harris's favourite copy of the Bible. As you're reading that, I'll make sure it is. Off you go. <laughs> okay. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So, I mean, that's pretty clear cut from God there. He's, he's saying that you're going to suffer the pain of childbearing and the husband will rule over you. And that's the way it's going to work from here on out. So can we deconstruct the fall in a little bit more detail in relation to the topic? Yeah, we can. Um, so again, it's kind of it's twofold. So you've got this idea that even therefore all women are gullible and can easily be tempted and therefore are pretty under like subordinate to men mm. um and additionally you've got this idea that women have this power to tempt men which had a massive influence throughout history of the role of women and how men need to be wary for women and wary about women's sexuality um however tribble again argues that perhaps the fact that the servant spoke to eve is because she's more intelligent mm. and that he shouldn't yeah you don't go to adam you go straight to the woman and she also goes into the idea that the, the the temptation part of like between Eve and Adam isn't actually present or doesn't go into much detail within Genesis. So um, there isn't this massive temptation where Eve is like, Adam, please do it, please do it, mm. please do it. We're kind of, it, this has been read into by other people. Let, let's have a bit of a to and fro here. So the first point being that, okay, Eve leads the world astray. She allows evil to enter the world through her own sin, the ultimate sin, the original sin. So it's woman's faults that we're in this mess and that we have to work and, and that you suffered during childbirth and that there's so many bad things in the world. But is it right that the devil would choose the more intelligent out of the two? I would seem pretty dim on the devil's behalf. I imagine he's quite intelligent. Perhaps he's got more of a chance of leading the world astray and fulfilling his own ends if he goes for the least intelligent of the two. Yeah, but I, th I think that's kind of like a misinterpretation of intelligence, right? Because like, the more intelligent you are, the more like inquiry, the more uh, intrigue you might have on the world. And you could appeal to someone who was more intelligent to say like, like you could get so much more knowledge and ah. somebody who's intelligent wants to know more about the world. Uh, Adam might just be quite content with mm. the way things are. Yeah, there's and a significant when... school of thought as well saying that, for example, that Adam doesn't succumb to the temptation of the serpent, but number one, he's not there. So it's not like the kind of serpent is kind of going, hmm, ha, should I choose one or the other? Um, and there's this kind of idea that Eve hasn't, and Adam as well, haven't been given the tools to argue. They don't have knowledge of good and evil. They don't know how to debate. They've only known an idyllic utopian paradise in the Garden of Eden. How would you react if you were a very naive child to someone kind of trying to argue and reason with you and explain to you to do something bad? Yeah. Um, maybe they are not given the proper tools. Maybe, and that's how God has planned them to be. Maybe he doesn't want them to have that knowledge. He clearly doesn't. They don't have knowledge of good and evil until they eat from the fruit. So there is a school of thought saying that they're not even prepared for this kind of encounter, that they can't argue or debate or reason. Again, it would be like a very naive child that doesn't know enough about the world yet. Mm. Perhaps we can alleviate the burden on women even further. I mean, the serpent, the devil himself has convinced Eve to sin, but it's Adam's convinced by Eve. He's not even a... Yeah, could I chip in here as well? Because uh, I do find it slightly amusing how quickly adam kind of dobs eve in when they're in the garden um so, king james version yeah so <laughs> again um no i just i'm not going to quote it all but the, the like so 
setting the scene, obviously they've they've just been made aware of their nakedness after having eaten the fruit. Mm. And then they hear God's footsteps in the garden. So they both decide to hide. And then God is calling them out saying like, where are you? Uh, and then once they made appear, God says, where art thou? And, and then Adam appears, uh, and says that, like, he's naked. And then God says, uh, how, how do you know you're naked? And it says, like, and the man said, the woman who gave this me to be, um, she gave me the tree, uh, and, and I, and I ate the fruit. <laughs> and it's like, like, how quick he's just like, it's her fault. Like, it's all her. Um, like, it, immediately Adam gives the response that the blame is clearly more on Eve than, mm. uh, than on himself there. Although he does admit that he did eat it himself as well, but, um, certainly he wouldn't have if it wasn't for her. Well, let's take the whole of Genesis now that we've we've got the accounts from Genesis 1, 2, and 3. How do you think these Christian teachings might have influenced our Western Christian society throughout the ages? I think that's like that's the big issue. So we could debate how this, these texts can be interpreted, but the issue is that they've been used in a specific way. So this text, Genesis, and these stories within Genesis have been used to make men throughout history fear female sexuality and suppress female sexuality in this concept that women are you know the devil's gateway mm. um they they tempt men they're not to be trusted their position within society should be very different to men and just a quote from saint ambrose and this may be not the nicest thing to hear so a bit of a spoiler for that adam was led to sin by eve and not eve by adam it is just and right that women accept as lord and master him whom she led to sin so there saint ambrose is saying that men should be in charge because you know women are more uh, you know, likely to be tempted and more kind of, uh, like Annabelle said, more gullible. Um, this is a very significant reading of the Bible, that especially a lot of medieval um, Christian scholars definitely held. Yeah, and just to add on to that point as well, is that the, uh, particularly when we're looking at the medieval period and even uh, before that in the Roman Empire, that the the idea that you could separate church and state wasn't a thing, really. The the, the state was the church and vice versa. And that um, because the emphasis on male disciples and male apostles and the and what that meant for the the role of priests and bishops uh, led obviously primarily by men, uh, that that automatically set the scene for for any politician likely to be a man as well and that that kind of automatically pushes women to the sidelines of any kind of leadership role in society so when we're looking at how the how much this has affected things well you could argue that uh, once christianity was adopted by the roman empire and the, that spread throughout europe that had a huge effect on how the role of women uh, mm. plays in in yes in politics but also just the wider culture so are there any other examples in the Old Testament, aka the Hebrew Bible, that we can draw out here in relation to what we're discussing? Good. So we're going to talk about the covenant ideal now. So before we kind of jump into this, we kind of need to know what a, what a covenant is. Andrew, can you help us out? What is a covenant? In biblical terms, we're talking about a agreement and relationship between God and his people, and that when God makes an agreement with said people, then there are certain expectations that they must follow, and that this this covenant is one that kind of gets renewed throughout the Old Testament. So it's it's not like so it's it doesn't necessarily change, but if if God gives a covenant towards Noah, uh, then he will kind of reaffirm that with Abraham and then reaffirm that with Moses and and it kind of continues to be reaffirmed up until the, the New Testament. Good. Excellent. So let's have a look at what the covenant ideal is. So we've just mentioned in Genesis 3, there is the fall of mankind where Adam and Eve commit the original sin and then are kind of kicked out of the Garden of Eden into the world. Now, what a lot of Christian thinkers think or believe is that this caused a, a rift in human nature, that we have now become separated from God and therefore separated with what made us fully human, that there is an absence. Um, so people like St. Augustine, for example, would call this original sin. In the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible itself, this is explicitly referred to. Um, and the, the covenant ideal becomes a way of trying to fix this absence and solve this problem and kind of reunite this relationship. And this is done through prophets, through several different covenants made um, between certain prophets and God. So, for example, we've got Moses and we've got people like Noah, like Andy mentioned earlier, um, and Jeremiah as well. And the idea is that by following certain rules that you are going to be reunited with your human nature. So if we take Moses as an example, um, you know, Moses delivers the Ten Commandments to the Hebrews or the Israelites while after they've escaped 
the rule of Pharaoh in Egypt. And these rules and commandments like don't kill, don't commit adultery, only worship one God, they're supposed to be reuniting humankind with its nature. So the idea that if humans follow these teachings, then they're more like the original Adam and Eve before the fall. That's the kind of general idea about it. So a covenant ideal is trying to almost reconnect that relationship with God by following certain covenant rules. Ah, very good. Now, how does this link with the ideas of gender that we've discussed? So let's do a positive spin on it first. So how could you see the covenant ideals as being for everyone? Well, the the covenants, if you look at the Ten Commandments, for example, aren't gender specific. It doesn't say, um, you know, women can't kill and men can. It says do not kill. They're for everyone. There's no kind of difference in, in discrimination there. Um, They're for everybody. Now, this is could be seen by people looking at kind of the, the teachings of the Old Testament or Hebrew world about gender to be that the God's teachings are for men and women, that mm. spiritually they are equal in every sense, that, that even though they may have different bodies, that spiritually they are equal before God. And that if they're equal before God, then surely ourselves as men and women, we should be treating each other equally. Or we could be more pessimistic and say that the whole point we need them is because the woman messed up in the first place. So we need to rebuild this relationship with God because it was ruined, which for some Christians traditionalists, is because of the fault of women. Are there any other examples of women in the Old Testament who can be seen as defining gender roles? Well, see, I mean, it's an interesting question. I'm, I'm going to subvert that a little bit and actually say, so they're not actually looking at any one particular woman, but teachings from the Old Testament and here is from, from the book of Exodus. So following... Following the Ten Commandments, which is obviously the one in which most people focus on, um, Exodus 21 onwards is a long list of different expectations, how different people should act. Um, and it's just interesting the language that is used and the, I guess, the society at the time and how things were supposed to work. Um, so this, this here is from uh, Exodus 22. King James King, Version? Of course. Uh, it's our favorite. And the, so, and this is verse 16. Um, and if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuse to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. And there you have like a, a dynamic where mm. the expectation is, is that if you're going to sleep with someone, you better be married with them, which is an interesting way of looking at kind of family and gender roles in the first place. But then it's kind of this transaction being made between two men, which is that you will be expected to kind of do dealings with the, this woman's father and that you, I can sign the marriage contract with this other man. And that if you can't do that, then you would be expected to pay the father uh, a dowry payment. Yeah, the in this case, I would argue that women are certainly being treated as property mm. rather than being their own individuals. It's worth noting as well that lots of women in the Bible are not named specifically, and the majority of the men are. So this could show a double standard potentially of, you know, women, just like Andy said, being seen as more property or kind of, you know, uh, just being there, but not seen as, as important or as authoritative when it comes to being part of these these stories and these teachings. One I want to raise is Tamar. So the story of Tamar is quite interesting in how she interacts with with the, the teachings of God and with society. So King David has a very interesting relationship with Tamar. So Tamar is married to one of King David's sons. King David's son dies. Um, and this means that Tamar needs to find a husband really, really quick. And if she doesn't, it effectively means that she is going to be kicked out of King David's kind of uh, realm uh, and is going to be, you know, in trouble effectively. And she's going to find it really hard to kind of look after herself. So what she decides to do is to disguise herself as a prostitute at the side of the road and actually seduces King David and actually, um, uh, you know, sleeps with him and becomes pregnant by him. And this is kind of an elaborate scheme to oh, keep really. herself within the bloodline mm. of David. Um, and kind of the only way she can do it in a sense in that time is to, is to sleep with him and kind of seduce him and tempt him. Um, and then she kind of does a, almost a little bit of blackmail there as well. Um, and manages to successfully stay within the line because then obviously David has to look after his, his child, um, by, mm. Uh, Tamar. So more connotations here of women being sinful, of leading man astray from the same thing that we've been speaking about in Genesis? Yes, you can see the connections with Genesis, absolutely, with Eve being this kind of uh, being easily tempted mm. and then tempting Adam. Again, we've pretty much got a very similar story here. Quite interesting, though, because some feminist scholars do interpret this story as being almost pro-women in a sense, because although Tamar is seducing men, she is in effect using 
the skills and things that she has at the time to be able to survive. If her goal is survival and trying to make the best of her situation, she is, in a sense, doing that. She's being active. She's not being passive. She's not kind of just waiting for you know, the, the prince to come along and save her, so to speak, because she's actively trying to mm. make sure that her bloodline is continued and that her life is still kept to a, a good standard. So some people interpret it as being positive. She's an active agent. She's not a passive agent. So we've had Eve, we've had Tamar. Is there anybody else that we can talk about female characters within the Old Testament that that have an impact on gender roles? Yeah, so you've got um, women like Abigail, who in 1 Samuel 25 really kind of subverts what we'd expect from a classic traditional biblical woman. So Abigail's husband um, is very ingracious towards David, who Mm. has become the future King David. So to save that relationship and ensure that David doesn't seek revenge on her people, Abigail goes behind her husband's back um, to, well, resolve the relationship. She does end up getting married to him, um, becoming one of his many wives, um, but there's this idea that women potentially have this power to govern or power within politics. So you mm. could link it to to the whole concept of women's role does not need to be necessarily quite domestic, but can be political. Um, and then you've also got uh, Esther in the Old Testament who say helps save her people, the Jewish the Jewish people from persecution. And these sort of women they they subvert gender norms. However, you could argue that. The words used to describe these women, they're subverting the subverting femininity, subverting what it means to be a woman. We're therefore saying they're more like men and not celebrating their femininity. We're saying we, we should subvert femininity. Like, why can't these women just be powerful women? Why have they got to be women who aren't like women? But they are. They do provide really, really good examples of women who take the lead, don't depend on the men around them and cause like some actual change with, mm. within their society. I think it's worth saying as well with the book of Genesis that, and other other books in the Old Testament that it really depends on your reading. So we've kind of talked about several different women, several different kind of stories within the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament about how gender roles are kind of interacting with society and how they are inter- interacting with each other and men. Um, and it very much depends on your reading. You can almost put a positive or negative slant on a lot of these different stories. And that's going to continue as well as we go into the New Testament. Fast forward to the New Testament. What's going on? Okay, so we've spent a lot of time trying to deconstruct the Old Testament. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning before we kind of dive into the New Testament that a lot of Christians feel that the fulfillment of this covenant ideal, which we mentioned from the Old Testament, is Jesus. That Jesus is salvation, is here to kind of reunite that relationship between humanity and God so that we can be like we were before the fall and achieve salvation through Jesus. Also, there was a guy called St. Paul, quite an influential guy, wrote most of the New Testament. Andy, I think you've got a, a handy quote from him that we're going to deconstruct. Preferably from the King James version of the Bible? Of course, it was St. Paul's favourite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is his letter to the Ephesians. Um, and we're looking at here chapter 5, and there is a very famous verse here, which um, we're going to read from chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth. <laughs> Cherish this. God, that is a mouthful. Do you want to leave? You don't have to. You don't have to read up. Cherish this. Cherish it. You don't have to do the whole thing. You can probably just leave it there. Okay, cool. Beautifully read, Andrew, and you managed to retain your cool throughout the whole quotation there. Um, what's Paul getting at here? 
I, well, the thing is, it's interesting because there's quite a lot of stuff that Paul's getting at here. The, I guess the easy takeaway is that the, the one thing that most people immediately jump on is that wives should submit to their husbands mm. and that that means that the husband is the one that dictates how the, the house runs and that makes the decisions and that women should respect the order of things. Um, but that's not the only, part of this because it seems to imply that there is uh, like a an order of the way things are and that when it says that women should sub submit to the man it, it likens that to the submission that the church has to christ uh, and that there's like this emphasis on the idea of sacrifice and that jesus had to sacrifice and that maybe when the man loves a wife that he also must like sacrifice certain things to give back to the wife and that it makes a very strong point of that like this can't just be a one-sided relationship men have uh like an order from god to love their wives and to provide for them properly and to show them uh, that sort of respect now i guess the problem here is which is that well, that sounds quite lovely that a, a husband looks after their wife. Um, some people might say, well, why is that a necessity? Why does the woman have to be the one who submits? Maybe it could be more equal or the other way around or that like, so the woman could make decisions and that maybe the woman's making more sacrifices than the man and that love isn't necessarily just a relationship between one dominant and one submissive, that there could be a far more complex way of looking at this relationship. It's a very heavily implied hierarchy here, where you've got God at the top or Jesus at the top, and then you've got the church, then men, then women. So you know, it'd be a very, very different passage if it said women also submit to the church or women also submit to, to God. And it doesn't say that. It says women, you should submit to your husbands, as if implying that, you know, that's the kind of next level up of the hierarchy or the scale. And then the men submit to the church and then the church submits to God. I think it's really hard to read this passage um, without that kind of hierarchy in mind. I mean, having said that, um, a lot of kind of translations of the word head of the church or head of the household can be kind of interpreted. So the word, you know, in terms of the the English word being you know head of in terms of the, the leader or in charge, but in the original uh, languages it could be kind of translated as something different potentially that maybe there's kind of like a an, an element that's not maybe necessarily in charge of mm. but it might be a more of an equal relationship but i mean personally i don't think the word submissive itself is uh implies equality if anything it implies inequality so i want to jump in here on ollie's idea of the chain of being as set out in paul those studying the A-level will be aware of Plato and Aristotle, who had different ideas of the chain of being, and they place women below men in this chain. I'll explain what the chain of being is in a bit more detail in a second. But certainly, the view I'm about to articulate can be attributed to people like St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, and St. Anselm as well. Now, if you think of this chain, this hierarchy, God heads the chain, and below God sits the angels. Below the angels sit the evil angels, including Satan, then humans, gorillas, dogs, tuna, snails, shrubs, dirt, things that can only exist in the mind, things that can't exist in the mind at all. So that's the hierarchy of being. You go from God to the top to things that can't even be conceived, like a square circle. And in around the middle, just below the angels, we find humans. Now, for Augustine, Aquinas, and Anselm, women are below men in this chain. So it harpens back to this idea biblically that they have these theological motivations for thinking it's so, but it's because they're sinful, because they cause the fall, is the reason why they're there, certainly for Augustine. Now, I've mentioned that evil angels are below angels on the chain of being. That's for the same reason. The fall of the angels, where Satan rises against God, he finds himself lower on the scale as well. Because on this scale, it's better to be good without sin than it is to be with sin. It's worse to have sin. So hence why women are below men in this chain of being. Now, Mary flies against this tradition with theologians. Mary's an example held up by the Catholic Church in particular as someone full of all the virtues in which Christians should try and live out their lives in accordance with. Um, can we speak a little bit more about Mary, who she was, and, and why she's important as a, as a figure for Christian feminists? So Mary, the mother of Jesus, is a very important person in Christianity and especially the Roman Catholic Church. In said church, she is known as Theotokos. Now, this is a Greek word which means God-bearer, which means that because Mary gave birth to the Son of God, to Jesus, that she has a very, very significant and important part of 
Christianity and especially the church. Yeah, uh, one other thing I want to add with that is that um, so since 1869, where the Catholic Church had its first Vatican Council, it uh, proposed that the Pope could be infallible or that the certain statements could be given that were considered inerrant. So there were no no problems with that. And the what's interesting is that very few of these statements have ever been made. But one of them is the the statement of the Virgin Mary. And her assumption. Um, we'll talk, quickly define that word in a second. But I'm just going to give a quote um, from Pope Pius the Twelfth, which he gave on November uh, 1950, where he says, "By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and by our, our own authority, we pronounce, declare, and define it to be a divinely revealed dogma that the Immaculate Mother of God, the Ever Virgin Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul." into heavenly glory um so it's interesting because it, it pinpoints that the, she is the mother of god mm. that she is the immaculate mother of god that she was a virgin and uh, that also once she had lived her earthly life she was assumed so she was kind of taken up into heaven and this also would point to the fact that she would have been without sin as well so her whole, her whole life is kind of perfect in the eyes of god it's worth noting here when we're talking about Mary and Mariology in general, um, it often gets referred to that Jesus is the Immaculate Conception and the Immaculate Conception is, is about Jesus being born of a virgin without sin. However, it, in Christian theology, the Immaculate Conception is the conception of the Virgin Mary herself. So the idea that Mary was born without sin from her mother in the Catholic tradition, St. Anne, um, and because she was born in such a way, she was ready to be the mother of um, God incarnate. And so it's really important to distinguish between this immaculate conception of Mary and the virgin birth of Jesus. That is a, there is a difference there. I think it's worth saying as well that there is a real big focus on Mary being sinless or being pure. And you can see that through the idea that she was a virgin. You can see this through the idea that she was um, the result of immaculate conception herself. So this big focus is the idea that she is pure in every way. Um, and let's connect this to gender and society then. So how is this actually connected to Christian ideas of how women should interact in society? Well, a Catholic would say that Mary is a form of role model. Mary is someone who was chosen to bear the child of God. She didn't choose herself. She never kind of went, I really want to be God's mum. An angel appeared before her and told her this was going to happen. I can confirm that Mary did not say that she really wants to be God's mum. Can you link it into how she is a positive role model in a bit more depth? So Catholics would say that Mary accepts her responsibility, that she is given, in a sense, a job to do, a role to fulfill from God, and it is her duty to do this. You know, so Catholic feminists, for example, would say that, you know, women have a duty to perform, they have a very, very important role, um, and that could be connected to motherhood as well. Um, but in a sense that she has autonomy, that she, she raises Jesus, she raises him well, she's with Jesus for a lot of his life and fully supports his teachings and is kind of loyal to him in that sense. Is there a flip side of this as well? Can we see Mary as not having autonomy? I think someone might be able to read into <laughs> that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it raises a whole bunch of questions about, um, you know, if, if she is that the Immaculate Conception herself and that she is unable to sin, then her sense of free will or agency is kind of completely gone. Because if if to be immaculate means to live by the perfect standard of God, when she is approached by the angel Gabriel, she doesn't choose this. This is completely imposed upon her. The mm. expectation is, is that she will do it and she has to do it. Uh, she, she couldn't have said no, because to say no would have been to sin. And she can't sin. So she's going to have the baby regardless. And then, uh, and then like she's expected not only that, but like to, to live like the perfect life afterwards. And there is, there are scenes within, uh, the gospels in which Jesus meets his, his siblings. And that also suggests that Mary went on to have other children. Now we don't know a whole lot about that side of the story, but it would suggest that she would have had to have presumably had sex and then had mm. children and the, then that raises a whole bunch of questions about like whether or not like was she married to joseph and all of these stuff and i don't know um so definitely worth analyzing and debating and the the bit you just said about a uh, choice as well is really really interesting because that links really nicely to one of the other topics uh within the specification so gender and theology topic because um scholar mary daly um who will come up in the next chapter 
talks about Mary and this idea that she is raped by the Holy Spirit because she doesn't have this autonomy. It, God almost forces himself upon Mary and she is forced to have this child. So can we link this with um, religion and society? How does how does this link with how um, perhaps women are viewed within contemporary society given our Christian values? Yeah, so the important thing here is that Mary is a mother and a virgin. So that is, she's the ideal. She's a mother and she's a virgin and something therefore that women should should try and emulate. However, in trying to emulate this, this is very clearly impossible to gain. So arguably there's like a human deficit within Mary. There's something missing that women can't aspire to. And there have been studies into the impact, the psychological impact, especially this can have upon women. Um, so for example, this idea that young women are told from a young age, you should aspire to Mary. Mary's such an empowering figure. But how can something be empowering when it's it's providing you with an unattainable ideal? Um, so you're, the idea that you should be a virgin and also be a mother, it just it doesn't quite it doesn't quite work out and it kind of removes a sense of autonomy and agency from women because they're told which I- identity they should be constructing, but then they can't get there in the end anyway. And the the Catholic Church really promotes this idea of the most important aspect of Mary being a mother. So she's completely defined by her sex uh, in this sense of, you know, being female and motherhood. And this is really raised up in a in a letter in 1988 written by John Paul II um, called the Maleris Dignitatum. Ooh. And this letter was written as a response to a lot of uh, kind of feminist critiques of the Roman Catholic Church, of people being quite critical of the church's approach to women. Um, and it's kind of supposed to be a, a somewhat kind of Catholic feminist response, and it's purely based on theology and purely based on the Bible, and a lot of it is based on Mary. This one's really important for the specification. Can you go into some more depth? Sure thing. So uh, the main kind of argument inside the Maleris Dignitatum is that motherhood for women is a sacred role and that the certain aspects of motherhood and the certain kind of lessons it teaches you and qualities it encourages are unique to women and should be in a sense kind of owned by women so motherhood is an experience that men will not have men will never have the experience of of pregnancy or giving birth and john paul ii is kind of trying to imply that that god has given almost a sense of gift to women this kind of gift of the maternal instinct and these are good positive things these are things that god wants and god has given you all the good qualities of a good mother are ultimately the qualities of a good Christian. And mm. that even men can learn from these qualities, things like, um, you know, being attentive, being loving, being strong in, you know, in adversity and all these, all these things. So it's very much a, a positive spin on this, um, idea of, of a, of a strong mother. And it does mention Mary a lot. It specifically mentions the fact that Mary faced challenges, um, in, in the carrying and giving birth of Jesus, but she overcame all these challenges. And even though, like Annabelle said, that she might be an unrealistic ideal, she can still inspire Roman Catholic Christians to be kind of the best mother and best woman they can be, and that this ultimately benefits both women and men in society. Is there any quotations from this malarious dignitatum which Ollie's referenced, which we can use to illuminate what Ollie's trying to get at? Well, that sounds awfully sarcastic, Jack, but I'll give it a go. Uh, this is from point 18. Motherhood is the fruit of the marriage union of a man and a woman, of that biblical knowledge which corresponds to the union of the two in one flesh. This brings about, on the part of the woman, a special gift of self as an expression of that spousal love whereby the two are united to each other so closely that they become one flesh. Wonderfully read. Um, so here we see what in relation to Mary, and, and let's start talking about the family and the roles of the man and the woman w- within the family home and the Christian scholars as well as the biblical teaching on the matter. Ollie, do you want to dive in? Let's set the ball rolling and we'll kick it about. Sure. <laughs> a lot of different mixed metaphors. There. <laughs> let's dive into that football pitch. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to kick off with uh, marriage. So marriage is, well, for those of you who are unsure, um, the union of two people together. Traditionally in Christianity, this is a man and a woman uh, recreating the union of Adam and Eve. So I think to start off, it's worth saying that in many different churches, marriage is a sacrament. What's a sacrament, Andy? So a sacrament is an outward sign of God given grace in which they will participate in certain rituals which will then allow them to feel closer to god the big ones obviously being things like the eucharist or baptism but in this context marriage is 
the or matrimony is the sacrament. And marriage is an incredibly important union for Christians, okay? They are effectively seen as the foundations of a good society. So this topic is gender and society. Christians are going to argue if you want a good society, if you want to have a society which is what God intended, you know, before the fall, then you need to have men and women marrying each other and having children. Uh, and this is kind of one of the main goals of marriage is to procreate and have children um, and to, you know, obviously teach them about God, teach them about Jesus, teach them about Christianity so they can kind of go forth um, and multiply themselves. Mm. It, it links quite nicely to a lot of the other scholars you'll probably be doing in philosophy of religion and religion and ethics. And I just want to reference a couple here. Aristotle and Plato certainly influenced the thinkers to come, such as Augustine Anselm and Aquinas. And there's this idea, particularly in Aristotle's writings, on telos, end or purpose, that is, in English from the Greek. And Aquinas adopts this too. So this idea that everything has a natural function or end, you know, the function of this this audiobook is for you to learn, the function for you to learn is so you can go to university, perhaps you might go to university for a good job or for the purpose of itself. So you've got these things, you've got ends for your actions, and ultimately there's, there's a telos, an end for your whole life. A part of a purpose of a woman, Aristotle might say, is to reproduce. And Aquinas is happy to carry this forward as well. Now, Aquinas, as you know from your studies of natural moral law, if you're doing ethics, he devises five primary precepts. He says, it's good if you fulfill your end, your telos. He gives five primary precepts about what someone ought to do to fulfill their end. Andrew, can you can you drop the five primary precepts for us? Yeah, so there's uh, the preservation of life and defense of the innocent, which is uh, part of the same parcel there. Uh, you have reproduction, living in an ordered society, uh, worshipping God. And the last one is, somebody remind me? Of the Nurture and educate the young? Nurture and educate the young, of course, yes. So, uh, yeah, just to unpack these ideas then. So if, if Aquinas thinks that there is a natural order to things, um, it, it means that kind of everything has a purpose in which it is aimed to fulfill. And that it's interesting that Aquinas puts so much emphasis on the idea of reasoning and that it, it's reason which kind of aims you towards God. And, uh, he, he takes this largely from his reading of Aristotle, where he, Aristotle talks of women as being in, well, certainly inferior in certain regards. And one of them is that he, he thinks that women are kind of quick to, to passion and to, uh, illogical arguments and that they are harder to reason with. And I think Aquinas agrees with that and says that, well, men, men are better reasoners. Uh, and that means that they're more in tuned with, with the, the divine and that they can be better at, well, a, a lot of things really. And that the, the word that both Aristotle and Aquinas use is the women are defective. So they are, they're kind of like, they're, they're from man, but they're like the worst version of man. And that going, I know we've just mentioned Aristotle, but it's worth talking about Plato as well, who says that women are the byproduct of people who lived bad lives in the past. So, hmm. um, so Plato believed that once, once a human being, um, died, that they either resurrected uh, oh, sorry, uh, reincarnated, really, I guess is a better way of talking about it. Um, and th that, like, the, the men who lived good lives would kind of, like, leave the earthly realm, but those who didn't, uh, would, uh, and lived perhaps lives of vice rather than virtue might end up being reincarnated as women. So it's interesting that he, he sees women as kind of the, like, the, the worse type, the thing that you might come back as if you don't live a fulfilled life. So let's connect this back to the Christian idea of marriage. So I think it's worth saying that pretty much all Christian churches uh, promote the idea of a marriage which has not been split up. So, you know, for, for many years, even still to this day, the Roman Catholic Church does not approve of things like divorce. So they would like the family unit to be intact, which means that if you take the sacrament of marriage, which is a union with your partner and with God, that you do that for your entire lifetime. And that obviously that you procreate within that marriage. Um, and again, Catholic families, for example, are encouraged to, you know, have lots of children, um, certain types of contraception also not um, allowed within those marriages, just to kind of fully what they what they believe um, fully fulfill God's teachings of, of procreation um, and of uh, marital harmony. The, the best place to raise and educate children would be within a marriage. So we're going to be challenging all of these Christian views in part two, which is coming up now, Secular Challenges and Responses.
thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash pansycast. The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at the Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)